The first day it stopped raining, a dam upstream let out a bunch of overflow. So whilst we were filming in the woods, we came back and the river had gone up like literally two meters, was like raging. It was white water. Yeah, 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 there was no way to get across. We had to do an emergency evacuation. (laughs) Casting through, through the bush to a road, walk back to the cars. We couldn't go back to the cottage to shoot there for the rest of the shoot. Um, One of our actors left on the back of that because they couldn't come back for reshoots. I thought you were going to say they went raging down the river (laughs) Yeah, we lost them in the Yeah, somewhere underwater. So the trauma in the actor's eyes is real. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) No, it wasn't difficult to to, to tap into that. Welcome to Bitch Talk. I'm your host, Aaron, here with my co-host, Ange, a.k.a. Captain Party. And over the last 10 years, we've been elevating marginalized voices through interviews and events. Sometimes over a glass of whiskey. If you're thirsty for more bitches, head over to bitchtalkpodcast.com and follow us on Instagram. A big thank you to 48 Hills and our listeners for voting us Best of the Bay Best Podcast in 2022 and 2023. And now, on with the show. Welcome to our South by Southwest 2024 festival coverage. Today you'll be hearing about narrative films that center around lies and finding out the truth. You will hear from the filmmaker from We Strangers and the lead actor, actress, and writer-directors from Bird Eater. Enjoy. Welcome to South by Southwest. We are excited to talk with the director and screenwriter of the film We Strangers, Anu Valia. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to meet you both over Zoom. Same, same. Hopefully next time in person. I'm really wanting to be in person all the time. That's all I want. (laughs) (laughs) I can't do the Zooms. Anyway, you're trying to tell me something. I'm sorry. No, I just, I want to get to your film. Our our audience hasn't seen it yet. So can you introduce them to We Strangers? Of course. Um, Yeah, so so We Strangers is premiering at South by Competition. I'm so excited for people to see this movie. It really is, God, it's its own weird little thing. So essentially, the film is about this woman, Ray, who's played by Kirby Howell Baptiste. And she um, works as a cleaning woman. She works as a commercial cleaner in in Gary, Indiana. And as she's working um, in in this psychiatrist's office, cleaning his office, the psychiatrist, Dr. Patel, invites her to start cleaning his family's home. And she starts cleaning his home. Then she starts cleaning his mistress's home. And as she starts working for this group of rich families um, across town, um, she tells this lie that she can speak to the dead, that she is psychic. And these families are all too, uh, they're too eager to believe her. And she basically starts continuing to lie and to to essentially to manipulate them and control them and have power in these places that normally wouldn't ever give her power. And the film is really my exploration about assimilating and and code switching and how the ability to be a chameleon is one that is like a superpower. It can be but it also takes from you. And I just wanted to explore this idea of like, you know, to be able to read a room and um, change who you are, we understand that that can take from you, but it also can be quite powerful and it can feel quite good to gain power in spaces that normally don't want to give you power. It can feel really intoxicating, but then it does take from you. And I'm I'm learning through through the making of the movie, through the living of life, that true freedom is the ability to truly deeply be yourself. And that is not allowed for many, many people to really feel the weight of like, feeling like you're an outsider or minority is is not, to really feel real freedom is not given to most people. Most people just need like food and shelter and <laughs> to be cared and loved. But like that extra thing of being really deep in yourself is like such a privilege. And this is my exploration on that. And I really wanted to make a movie that's not like an issues movie that is only for the people who come to it. Like uh, my attempt with the film and the tone of the movie, I'm trying to create 
the feeling of what it really feels like. So the tone of the film is this like very specific, une- like there's two kind of feelings in the movie is like this feeling of like what's, I can't say like suspense and thriller because that's very genre, but it's like this this kind of unsteady feeling of like what's going to happen and I don't feel entirely comfortable. And that to me, I'm just trying to create the feeling of what it feels like to not be comfortable in other people. And that's my goal with the movie. So the tone is sort of this, like, it really is its own thing. Like, I, I, it, I don't have, like, it's not like movies that are out right now. Like, it really is just this uneasy suspense. <laughs> it's like, with, with, sprinkles of like dark comedy and like little sprinkles of like release of that tension is is because I also have a comedy background so there's some oddly funny moments in it and um it's very much like my sense of humor and so um that's what the film's about and it's uh I'm just so excited for people to experience it and and then and then tell me what they feel because it's also like meant to create a dialogue and um because part of the filmmaking process is you have questions about the world you make with people you care about, your other collaborators, you continue to ask and discover together. And then you discover more in the edit and then you release it out into the world and you give it to other people. And then you ask, what what did it make you feel? And so I'm excited to do the final part of the process, which is asking is showing it to others and be like, and, and listening to what people feel about it. Anu, you are already ta- you started talking about like the feeling of the film, and I was clenching the back of my teeth the entire time, and my gut was like Ugh, the whole <laughs> time. The pacing yeah. is so wonderful. How did you manage to keep that feeling on set? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, because we're very me and the actors, I think like we're all very joyful and there's so much love. Like everybody knew what the film they were making was. Um, oh, that's so interesting. That's a really good question because I think I was just, you know, the Coen brothers have said, or maybe this is a possible story, but whatever, something that I've heard that I really took in, which was um, you are the, the director's only job is to be the arbiter of tone. That's all, you are taking this film that we did not shoot in order. We did not have that luxury. So, you know, you, you're breaking it up on set and you just have to make sure the tone, the pace and the tone, once you put it back in order, it will, it will sustain what you think it's going to sustain. And we just broke it up every day. (laughs) And I would try to just, that was my biggest, biggest thing on set. My biggest thought on set, because there's nobody else thinking about it. Our editor was not on set. He was in New York. And so we would talk on the phone, you know, he would be going through dailies and stuff, but it was always just like, there's a scene, well, I don't want to give things away. Not that I think it's even a movie you could give away, but the point of the film is you're not <laughs> supposed to really know what's going to happen. So, um, cause she doesn't. And um, the, <clears throat> I am trying to answer your question. Essentially, I would just be very aware of like, are we sustaining this level of like uncertainty and unease when Ray is in like the white family spaces. Um, and I was, I don't, I, you aren't really sure. You're just kind of hoping <laughs> that you do, but on set, you know, you're just also talking and laughing. And, and I, I would, I try to like allow for the actors to play in a sandbox and just try to rein things in. If I feel like totally, maybe it's not in the right space, but but they also knew the film they were in. So that was mm-hmm. that was really helpful. Yeah, like you said, this film is a lot about, has a lot to do with race and class. And uh, yeah. as, as the writer of the screenplay as well, uh, every year, especially in this country, these terms are shifting and evolving. So I'm curious to yeah. know how through the years, did the story change? Did you add, did you take away? Um, and, and also in directing your own work, does that give you added pressure because you're so attached to it? Well, yeah, I mean, like race is so important in the movie and and how how people connect by othering is also interesting to me. And so I was like, Ray is black. She's brought into this white family by an Indian man who, I think some and all this stuff is subconscious, right? It's like this person is like a 
brown man bringing me into this white space, it's probably not gonna be that bad or weird. I'm sure I'll be fine, you know? And then like, it's just slightly uncomfortable. Cause like, to me, what I've noticed so much, especially as like an Indian woman growing up in Indiana, which I grew up in Northwest Indiana, but still like at the time, it's actually a lot less so now, which is really nice to see you know, we were like 30 miles outside of Chicago and it's still, it was somewhat racially segregated where I grew up. And I just noticed this, like the subtleties of, of, of the subtleties of, I was going to say racial discrimination, but it's more specific than that. Just like the ways people would interact with each other was so interesting to me. And I was like, you can't, you, you watch people like be so careful with how they're speaking. And it was just so fascinating to me. And um, one thing I'm really interested in is like, there's a scene with one of the white men speaking to Ray and he is, he sees her as an other, but he also wants to connect with her. He's like a nice guy. Like that's, it's like, nobody was, nobody's trying to hurt other people's feelings. It's just like, everyone's limited by their own personal experience and their own worldview. And the way he's trying to connect with her, someone he also sees as an other is to other his like old Indian boss. And I just thought that was so fat. And then Ray is like deeply uncomfortable. Cause she's like, I know what's going on. Like Ray is also a master at reading people cause she's been forced to her whole life. And she's just like, I'm not going to create waves. And I don't want to like analyze one scene too much because I think that's even, I want to allow people to just feel it. Because again, I think I'm not trying to say something. I'm just an observer. And I'm just trying to like observe how I think people are with each other and like present that because I I know when people are trying to tell me what to feel, I'm like, well, I already kind of know what I feel. <laughs> I just want to like observe and then actually my my feelings shift based on what I see and experience as opposed to being told to change how I feel. Um, and so I don't know if I answered your question, but that is, race is both so important to the film and it's also not, it's supposed to also just be kind of playing in the background because it's not actively on the tip of everyone's tongue. I think that's too one note. That's not how people are actually moving through the world. And wait, you had a second question. It was just having written the screenplay and now you're oh, directing yeah. your own work. If that adds a pressure because you're so attached to it or is there an added confidence because you know what you want from oh, it? Oh, I'm definitely not so attached to it because I, I really, the material shows you what it needs to be. You put the scene on its feet and it either works or it doesn't. And I find that really comforting because it's not about, it's really not about me. It's like, I conceived of this, but now I'm working with a bunch of other people and you're watching the scene play out and it's either like really awesome. And then you find out in the edit, it doesn't work. <laughs> or it's like really not working. And you're like, okay, I can't pretend it is. And I think I would say it's it's more like there's story, we all as a group. Like I think when I say we, I mean the actors, the department heads, the crew, and then in post, the editor, sound designer, composer. We're all trying to create something that is creating a feeling. I am just one part of it. And I'm just like, maybe like the top arbiter of it. That's just kind of like, oh no, it needs to shift this way. This it's, it's basically to my taste. I have to like listen to my taste as like the leader, but it's not all me. It's like everyone else is bringing themselves and their experience to it. Um, and I'm just the person that's making it not muddy, I guess, hopefully. <laughs> and, but in terms of pressure, it's more, um, it's finally, you know, when you write and direct something, you're expressing yourself and it's so such a relief to finally express myself. It's been so long. I've made short films and then I, I'm also a television director and I direct other people's writing and that's really beautiful in its own way. I get to find myself in other people's words. But I finally, for the first time in my life, I get to find, I get to express myself through my stuff. And that's really a, a genuine relief. Like I felt I was experiencing Ray's story, which is like just getting to express. And some people will like it and some people won't get on the, won't be on the wave. And that's okay too. And I want to hear why. And, um, but one, one thing I did notice, which was really interesting is like, as a television director, I'm on set with other people's words and there's a writer on set and, and I'm, I'm trying to enact someone, I'm trying to realize someone else's vision. So when a scene wasn't working, there'd be like a team of writers that could like rewrite and like, and I could just then go off and be with the actors and try to make like work with the actors only like as a divide and conquer. 
but I didn't have that on this film, of course, because I'm the writer and the director. So it was it was something that I didn't anticipate was navigating the scenes as a writer. Because sometimes I'd want to rewrite the scene and it didn't need it. I just needed to be only the director and trust the writer I was. But sometimes I would have to rewrite on the spot. And that, I didn't, I'm not practiced at that. And there were times I have to rewrite with a line or like, you know, the button of this isn't working, I have to rewrite it. And I, I'm not practiced on that pressure. I'm like practiced on like con consolidating coverage or like doing things you have to do last minute, but that was very new to me. And I was like, oh, this is hard. <laughs> like thinking of like a great line on the spot is like really hard, you know? And so that um that was fascinating that was like definitely a learning curve but um you just have to do it more to get better at it i guess i i did want to touch on uh, i love when music uh is really um prominent in films and i loved going the back and the forth of the hip-hop like now hip-hop and then like 60s soul can you talk about yeah. those choices and who your music supervisor was and were you involved oh, in all like of those Mm -hmm. oh I know I'm a music nerd Ange knows yes. I was waiting for the music I knew she was gonna I ask knew, the music yeah. question so. <laughs> obviously I um that's I'm that Kat Matt is our music supervisor and she is going to be so excited about this music is so so we have two ele two musical elements which is our the composed music the score of the film which was composed by Jay Wadley and then the music the diegetic source music in the movie which is so important because the music tells you who these people are, what they listen to. And so like Ray is listening to current hip hop, like also some songs by local Gary artists that I'm really excited about. Like a lot of like, she's listening to like, you you learn who she is by the stuff she likes. You learn things about people by the things they like, by the, and then she learns about other people in the house by the things that she cleans, by, the, by their objects. And then you have this other character that's listening to, um, there's this other character who is the daughter of one of the families. And she listens to like a more contemporary hip hop artist that has crossed over, like a black artist who has crossed over, not crossed over, that's not the right word at all actually. It's that she has, white people have accepted her. And so mm -hmm. she's listening to her, like this other artist and that's just, in, again, just interesting. There's no value judgment to that. That's just like, oh, that's interesting. And then the white, then there's a party with all of like the older <laughs> white people and they're listening to like 80s <laughs> rock music that was very popular when they were kids. And then Ray and Mari, her best friend, um, or I'm sorry, Ray's mother, Willie, like any, any scenes that are kind of tied to like, Ray's home life or mu she's listening to sometimes music that her mom used to listen to. So like her and her best friend will listen to music that their mom used to listen to, which is more sixties, like soul Motown. Cause also the film takes place in Northwest Indiana. There's a lot of Motown influence. So like what people listen to and like, and then when she's on the, when Ray is driving around, she's mm -hmm. listening to Dr. J's, um, blues radio station, mm -hmm. which is a which Dr. J, Larry Jenkins is um, is the prime minister of the blues. He has his own radio station in Gary, and he oh. is mm. he's unbelievable. The music he plays is so great. So he is also our like shepherd of that that music that is uh, a very real radio station. <laughs> but obviously, like we picked our own music and all that. So it, it's to me what music is is it allows you a little bit more of an insight into like the era like where these people are in life and like music is so it's such an easy way to understand like what a person's taste is and also then a little bit of where your upbringing is who the people you're surrounded by are so that uh, was super important very fun to kind of design every character's music taste was a real laugh it was very funny I like like I'm not a big 80s hair metal and I was a little like Sometimes I make a couple of these thoughts a little grainy, but it was like fun to be like, okay. Uh, and then to just, it was fun to like live in those worlds is a real uh, delight. Well, thank you so much, Anu. We definitely need to have you back because there's so much more to talk about, but- There's so uh, much more. Yeah, until then, congratulations on We Strangers, again, premiering at South by Southwest. We'll see you again on your for your next project. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch and I uh, can't wait to hear what people think about it.
All right, Bitch Talkers, you're in for a treat. We're coming from South by Southwest 2024. We're talking to the two lead actors and the directors of Bird Eater. I'm going to have y'all introduce yourself since we have a big group here. I'm going to start with... Hi, I'm Jack Clark. I'm the writer and co-director, Bird Eater. I'm Jim Weir, co-director. I'm Shabana Aziz. I'm an actor. And I'm Mackenzie Fernley, also an actor. And I'm going to let Jack... Tell our audience what Bird Eater is about. No, Bird Eater is about uh, a really awful bachelor party in the <laughs> outback. Um, where maybe you can do it actually. <laughs> yeah, so the the groom invites his own fiance to the Bucks party with the boys on this uh, rural property in the outback, and uh, some secrets come out about their relationship, and the night takes a really really feral turn. <laughs> Yeah, to put it like mildly. Um, so we t- we love talking to independent filmmakers and the struggle that it takes to make these films and put them out there. But you your shoot faced extraordinary uh, struggles to, <laughs> yeah. to get out there. Mm. So before you even started filming, we had COVID issues, environmental issues, <laughs> and you had to recast and you had to reshoot. Can you just kind of tap into the struggles you had even just to get this film made? Yeah, well, Jack, Jack and I found this um, great property that we wanted to sh- shoot essentially the whole movie at, which you had to you had to cross a stream by foot to get to the property. Um, a small and it stream. Didn't, it didn't really <laughs> register to us as a big issue. But uh, when we started filming, it was the start of La Nina, that weather event where it just didn't stop raining for weeks and weeks and weeks. So as we were shooting... Uh, this stream turned into like a raging river over the course of about two weeks, and we we managed it for a while. We got like gum boots for everyone, and we got <laughs> waders for everyone. We built we built a ferry out of um, a gate on the property and some oh stand up paddle boards. Wow. So we were like literally ferrying like uh, cast and gear across. <laughs> our, yeah. Yeah. Camera gear people. <laughs> yeah, this could have been the side this, film. Yeah. 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 This should be in uh, like like behind the scenes stuff. Yeah, the thing is we couldn't afford to have behind the scenes like <laughs> very done. few photos of it. Yeah, yeah, there's like not that much record of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, the first the first day it stopped raining, a dam upstream let out a bunch of overflow. So whilst we were filming in the woods, we came back and the river had gone up like literally two meters, was like raging. It was white it was, water, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was nowhere to get across, we had to do an emergency evacuation. <laughs> Casting through through the bush to a road, walk back to the cars. We couldn't go back to the cottage to shoot there for the rest of the shoot. Um, one of our actors left on the back of that because they couldn't come back for reshoots. I thought you were um, going to say they went raging down the river. You never saw them. Yeah, we lost them in the somewhere underwater. So the trauma in the actor's eyes is real. Oh, we yeah, know yeah. why. No, it wasn't difficult to, to, to tap into that. <laughs> um, it was yeah, fairly it's traumatic. Quite funny now. <laughs> we can laugh now, yeah. yeah. Spatially, it was quite a challenge because we ended up picking a new location for the second block. So, the eventual geography of the space was a combination of a bunch of different locations that we had to kind of map in camera. But oftentimes, we were doing scenes in the second block that people weren't realizing were already half shot and sort of we were combining rooms from the old house with the new house and it ended up being pretty seamless actually because it's it, 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 a lot of it's quite mid or quite close so it's easy to sort of blend things but it was a real sort of puzzle yeah <laughs> <laughs> and now you're here at South by Southwest now we're here <laughs> yeah we eventually got here yeah. yeah thank you so this this is a film really from a woman's perspective I feel when sure. I watched it but here we are with two men that wrote it can you talk mm-hmm. about the evolution of the script and and the story. Well, I'd say to begin with, we we st- well we started with a very focused like uh, couple story, so it didn't have the bachelor party dressings, it didn't have that sort of arena around it, and we started with a couple, and we wanted to have a really uh, interesting look at um, codependency in couples that we hadn't seen before, but we had sort of seen in our immediate friend circles, um, and then we were sort of designing a scenario in which a couple would naturally separate or where a social expectation would be that they'd uncouple for at least a night and that seemed to us a Bucks party or a bachelor night. Um, And then it took on a whole new aura because it had that sort of gender dynamic, it had that sort of um, weighted male presence. And then it became very much a story to us about uh, male friendships 
being observed or male friendships with an audience attached and exactly how conversations between men occur when people are watching or, or, or even if there's just a camera because the idea was sort of you bring an audience to something like a Bucks party where there is this um, ritualised aspect to it or there's sort of this there's shared secrets or there's a shared sense of um, we're all kind of doing the wrong thing but, but because it's a communal um, activity we can sort of excuse ourselves and then bringing new people to that scenario and then having a camera there it sort of feels like there's two audiences to the behaviour. So, yeah, it was mostly about, for us, it, it, it takes a while, I think, to really know what a film is about as well. We sort of had multiple iterations of what we thought the film was really about. But it was only sort of right towards the end of, like, post and editing all, it all together that we realised it, it, it did feel to us about... Uh, conversations men have with each other and, and, and sort of we are saying that we want this ne not necessarily to have any answers for old conversations but hopefully to start new conversations to start new questions um, and we sort of like putting that to an audience as well yeah yeah it, it does get real complicated I, I want to turn to our actors here um, you play our lead couple whose relationship is a lot more complicated and toxic than it first seems um so how did you create this trust with each other to film really difficult scenes and also for Mackenzie if you can talk about you have to play sort of a victim and an abuser and find that fine line yeah well I think that's that's the thing uh about these uh, abusers is that they would never think or, or uh, would dare to think that they actually are the abuser. I think the way that they justify their behaviour is always to be the victim. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it, playing someone like that is yeah, fairly unpleasant because you're aware as the actor of the thing that you're doing, but when you're playing that character, you have to feel justified or vilified in, in your actions. Um, and yeah, in terms of working together, we had, I suppose, because uh, as, as you mentioned before, um, a lot of complications in pre-production. <laughs> Trauma bonding. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, and we, al we also had a lot of time, although we were in separate states in Australia, we did, um, because things kind of get getting pushed back, we did have a fair bit of time um, to, to talk about the relationship and to, I suppose, come up with a plan how, how we were going to hit the ground running. Um, so, yeah, I think that was really helpful. Yeah, and with the, like, I mean, difficult scenes, if you mean, like, the intimacy and stuff, and we had a, we had an amazing intimacy coordinator mm. who did so much work. Um, mm. And I, I actually, I do, I do wonder about what your process was with working with her because, as the directors, because I think when I got the script, there wasn't any intimacy in it, and then we had a meeting with the intimacy coordinator and then she learnt all our boundaries and then you sent a script that was relevant to our... Yeah. Which was so cool because that never happens. Um, mm. yeah. yeah, that was kind of a sick process yeah. actually. That really helped. Michaela Caratini is her name. We had a lot of chats about um, intent, um, what me and Jack were intending. Um, and then she would just ask us a lot of questions, give us different ideas. She was really involved creatively. We, me and Jack had what turned out to be the wrong idea about intimacy coordinators that they kind of try and neuter the work you, you want to do, um, make it like less and less intimate kind of thing. Uh, but she was almost the opposite. She was like, well, if this is your intent, then like maybe this would work or this would work. Um, and she gave us a lot of ideas. Super, super valuable member of the team. And then she's a writer as well. So she was, yeah, was able to sort of workshop ideas with us on the fly and, and it was really collaborative. Yeah. Yeah, and she's also a choreographer, so she did uh, the dance choreography for the dancer. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She wasn't she wasn't that the, that performer, but she did the choreography. And we and that and because of the like pressured timeline, we didn't even see that performance until the day of. Until we were in a field in the middle of winter. Right. And they yeah, just you were there. busy building rafts and you were doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sailing the seven seas, yeah. <laughs> I'll start with the actors, but maybe it's a conversation for the whole table. But how do you actually process this kind of storyline with each other? It's so serious. It's it's also a little scary and creepy at times. Like when you come off of the set, 
Do you two talk about what that was, how you felt? Is there a therapist on site? <laughs> um, I think we were all each other's therapists <laughs> by the end of it. Um, I suppose, obviously, when you're, when you're working, when you're there on set, you, you do have to a- approach it with as much res- respect as it deserves. And with a story like this, I think, obviously, it does deserve a lot of, um, of respect. But I think you also need a fair bit of levity after you're done um, to kind of pull yourself out of that. I think that was really helpful to have everyone around to be able to, you know, put tools down and then just go, okay, let's try and uh, relax until we have to go do this again tomorrow and try and rely on each other to kind of keep ourselves out of that when we weren't um, there on set. Yeah. Also, I feel like the having pre and like um, Jack and Jim made us like homework PDFs um, with like reading lists and watch like things to watch homework, and like questions yeah. to answer. It was like proper homework, um, and that was really <laughs> helpful yeah. and really cute because I think I think then we went into it um, knowing exactly what we were intending to do and exactly what the parameters would be mm-hmm. in terms of the story and and the difficult themes um and so that was really great because then you kind of knew where you were going so you knew that where how to come out but sometimes I feel like with subject matter like this it might feel like you're just throwing hurling yourself off a cliff and then going hopefully it's okay but it wasn't like that because we did homework <laughs> yes I'd say most of our difficult conversations were in pre-production and then by the time we're on set you kind of want to be talking to the actors as little as you have to and let them do their <laughs> own really thing because they have their own right. yeah. We, yeah we're actually just meeting yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah what Mackenzie is talking about with levity as well became super important for um for for Mackenzie without getting into it too much but like depicting abusive behavior or depicting an abuser um, using levity in film as well or, or d- just even talking about the performance like the idea of building villainy um, but also sort of seeding levity into that I think sort of it creates chinks in, in the armour with characters and it sort of um, like I always think about it if, if, if you see this person who has all of these machinations um, I think seeing them kind of stumble over their words or seeing them make an error that is just like unintelligent and an audience can see that it does sort of break down this um, facade of or, or being unapproachable or being intimidating and a lot of abusers are like this as well so it's sort of it's, it's sort of about depicting abusive behavior in a way that's really approachable for an audience speaking of unintelligent I want to talk about this horrible <laughs> game you taught me called Paranoia. Is this in Australian? Is this popular in Australia? And is there ever a good time to play this game? It just causes fights. It's yeah, just, I've played it if with you my want friends. to break up yeah, with we've friends, played it before, yeah. you have. It's popular in it's Australia. It's fairly popular. Yeah, yeah for um, those listening who don't know the rules of Paranoia. <laughs> Let's play right now. Yeah. <laughs> you buy up this podcast. You, whis- you whisper a question in uh, someone's ear to your like right. Uh, where the answer is going to be someone in the room, so it'll be like uh, most likely to cheat on their girlfriend. You just whisper this secret question, um, and then the person will answer. Oh, that's got to be uh, Mac. It's Mackenzie. <laughs> <laughs> I would have guessed him too. So Mackenzie, <laughs> Mackenzie knows he's the answer to the question, but he doesn't know what the question is. And then you flip a coin. If it's heads, everyone gets to hear the question. Mackenzie gets to know the question he's the answer to. But if it's tails. No one gets to hear the question. Uh, so Mac knows he's the answer to a question, doesn't know what the question is, and that's why they call it paranoia. This is not good at all. It's a bad game. <laughs> it's it's, it's a bad game. game. Wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. 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 It's so mean. It's yeah, super exactly. Mean. That's the idea. Yeah. 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 All Aussies, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's why bunch. they're so tough. Mean bunch. Yeah. <laughs> but as soon, yeah, yeah. As, soon as, as soon as you have, there's more than one of you in the game as well, as soon as you have a partner, that makes you so much more vulnerable because the idea is kind of that you want their partner to answer them for a question. Oh, you want something kind of, That's kind of the idea. You're trying yeah. to get in between them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe for your wedding anniversary. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, <laughs> we really enjoyed this film. It's called Bird Eater. We've been speaking with Jim and Jack and Shabana and uh, Mackenzie. So thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. Thank, thank, thank you. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks for having us. Congratulations. Yeah. You did it. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on today's show. 
You can find more information about this episode in our show notes. If you're missing us, you can visit us at bitchtalkpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter and buy us a cup of coffee. Did you know we're also on the radio? You can find us at bff.fm. And lastly, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. All the cool bitches are doing it. This podcast is a proud member of the bff.fm podcast network. Learn more at podcasts.bff.fm. BFF.fm, best frequencies forever.